So we have uh, paper two, October, November, 2020, economics. Source material, destruction of forest in Indonesia. Okay, there's a fact file 2017 for Indonesia and the world. Indonesia is the world's largest producer of palm oil. The costs involved in producing palm oil include rent of land, fertilizer, palm oil seeds, maintenance of irrigation systems, and casual labor. Fires are set to clear forests to make way for palm oil plantations. These fires destroy the homes of many species of wildlife, of wildlife and release harmful gases into the air. Since 2011, Indonesia has been paid to conserve its forests by the Norwegian government. While Indonesia is the largest producer of palm oil, it is the third largest producer of rice. Indonesia exports 85% of its palm oil, but sometimes has to import rice to meet domestic demand. Its, its international trade in palm oil and rice is influenced by changes in its foreign exchange rate. The price of the Indonesia currency, the rupiah, fell in 2017. Rice production also contributes to air pollution. Rice from has bond is trouble left after harvesting to clear the fields and to raise the fertility of the land so they can produce more rice. Some environmentalists argue that trouble burning should be banned. The Indonesia economy, along with the world economy, continues to grow. Economic growth can cause pollution. It can also affect the, a country's GDP per head ranking and human development index ranking, as shown in this table. So we have different countries with their table. So Indonesia experiences net emigration. That's different between immigration and immigration. So Indonesians work abroad and send money home to their families. People also come from abroad to work in Indonesia. Some in relatively high-paid jobs in the country, expand in the country's expanding tourism industry. Indonesia currently attracts fewer tourists than its neighbors, Singapore and Malaysia. It does, however, have many natural tourist attractions and is currently price competitive. Answer all parts of these questions and refer to the source material in your answers. The first question says, calculate the percentage of total world outputs of palm oil produced by, by Indonesia in 2017. We just go back to the table, the products. We have 2017 Indonesia for palm oil is 60, which is the same as 60%. I think that is clear. Question one is 60%. Mm -hmm. You could write 60 is the same. Question two. So identify two variable costs of producing palm oil. Variable costs are the cost that changes as the level of output changes. So for the, the variable cost of producing palm oil here is the cost of fertilizers and the cost of casual labels. Casual labor, not labor, casual, because you get wages. The third question, C, they said, explain one opportunity cost of conserving forests in Indonesia. So first you have to define opportunity cost, which is what the next best alternative for gun. So the opportunity cost of conserving the forest in Indonesia is the palm oil or rice that will not be produced. I think that is clear. Is it clear, please? For question four. Question D, they said, explain to external cost of the destruction of forests in Indonesia. For what is external cost? External cost is the action or inaction of firms, individuals, or governments that is harmful to third party. So when we talk about third party, we're talking about those that are not involved in that economic action. So in as much as you are not involved in that action that has brought about a cost for you, it is an external cost. I think it's clear. Yes. So an example of external cost here is the loss of wildlife, wildlife habitats that which has been destroyed, mm. and pollution, which might you know, which might be uh, which might be as a result of carbon emission into the air. So these are external costs. I think that is clear. Yeah. We go to one E. It said draw a demand and supply diagram to show the effect of a ban on burning stubble on the market for price. Because based on the case study, they said uh, burning stubble will will increase the production of rice. Yes or no? So if government bans burning, uh, if government bans that action, it means there will be reduction in the production of rice. A reduction in the production of rice will shift the supply curve of, or the supply curve leftward from S1 to S2. At that point in time, the quantity supplied of rice would contract making the price of rice to increase from P1 to P2. I think that is clear. Yes. 
we go to question F. It says analyze the relationship between the country between countries' GDP per head ranking and HDI ranking. So we're talking about the GDP per head. We're talking about GDP divided by the population. And HDI, we're talking about human development index, like living standard, like education. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there, based on what we have here, there's a direct relationship between the GDP per ranking and HDI. So the highest ranked country here is Luxembourg, which, which is ranked second in the group, and is having the highest HDI here, which is 20. So that means, well, the first point here is that there's direct relationship between HDP head ranking and HDI, uh, GDP per head ranking and HDI ranking. The second point I made is that the top three countries, the top three here, Luxembourg, Mauritius, and Indonesia, they have the highest HDI ranking. That's the second point I made. That's the first thing. Then the third point I make is the exception of Cuba, which is having a high HDP rank, HDI ranking, but a low GDP per head ranking. Cuba. That's an exception. And Denise has uh, not the highest HDI ranking. It has the highest among the top, the top three, yes, except for Cuba. Yeah, Cuba, yeah. Cuba. And that's what I said, the third point I'm making. Did you get the point I'm making or not? I said the first three countries, the first three ranked, top ranked countries here has the highest HDI ranking. That's the point I made, the top three. Uh, I made emphasis on the top three. Yes. Now, the fourth point I make, uh, the top point I make now is that the exception of Cuba, which is having a high G HDI ranking with low GDP ranking. This might be as a result of investment on healthcare by the government of Cuba. Yes. I think that is clear. Is it clear, please? Yes. So that's about that. Done. We go to question. We go to question G. 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 For question G, uh, said, discuss whether or not the immigration of workers would be likely to be benefit, would be likely to benefit the Indonesian economy. Yes, the immigration of workers is likely to benefit the Indonesian economy based on the following is one. They might bring new skills and ideas, which may improve the productive capacity or production method mm -hmm. of Indonesia. Two, it might increase the size of the workforce. And if the size of the workforce increases, output will increase in the economy. That's the second point. And the third point I'm making here is that immigrants that are coming in might come to fill the positions that have been left by Indonesians who are out of the country. So these are the reasons why immigration, uh, immigrants, uh, immig immig uh, immigration would be beneficial to the Indonesian economy. I think it's clear. Yes. So we'll go to H. So discuss whether or not the Indonesian tourism industry will increase in the future. So based on what I would, I said, Indonesian tourism may increase in the future based on the following is one. Indonesia has natural tourist attraction which may be preserved. So they have a natural tourist attraction based on the case study. Mm -hmm. So the only thing they have to do is to preserve it. Do you understand? If they preserve it, that means it can be useful in the future. So that will encourage more tourists to come into Indonesia. The second point I make is that they said the market for tourism is price competitive. And if it is price competitive, that means it is growing. So because it's growing, it will encourage more tourists to come in. It will, it will, it will, uh, it will attract global audience because it's highly competitive. And if it's highly competitive, the prices will cheap. Do you get the point I made there? Mm -hmm. Is it clear, please? Yes. And the third point I make is that according to what is being said, income in the economy, income, world income is increasing. And if world income is increasing, disposable income would increase. So people will be able, might be able to spend because they want to take time out from work. As the, as, as the level of income increases, people will start thinking about leisure. They want to have time out. Instead of working and working and working, they want to have time for enjoyment too. So that could make them to go to Indonesia. Is it clear? Yes. So that's not about question one. Question two. Question two says, Okay, Mexico has a history of trade deficits. 
That means the export, the import is more than exports. Trade import is more than trade exports. Mm -hmm. The government is moving the economy closer to free trade to try to improve its macroeconomic performance. It was predicted in 2017 that Mexico's economy would experience a small rise in its unemployment rate. The economy's inflation rate was 6.6%. The highest rate since 2001. A number of policy measures may be used to reduce inflation, including increasing the rate of income tax. <clears throat> One thing is this. There's always, a, 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 there's always a relationship between inflation and unemployment. If unemployment is increasing, inflation would reduce. So there's indirect relationship between unemployment and inflation. So if the government of a country wants to reduce inflation, it could try to increase unemployment because they have inverse relationship. I think it's good. great. So we'll move on. Now they said divine trade in goods balance. Trade in good balance is the value of exports of goods minus import of goods. Clear. Yes. We'll go to question two. Explain two benefits producers may gain from free trade. If there's free trade, one, it means that there's global relationship, which could lead to advancement in technology. So because there's free trade, you will be able to have access to technology. And having access to technology would improve your method of production, which increases your output. Do you get the first point there? Do you get the first point I make? Okay. When there is free trade, it means you can have access to technology. You could get technology from anywhere across the world. And having access to technology, advanced technology, means that you can use it in your own country to improve your production method. Is it not an advantage? Yes. The second point I make is about global trading, as producers may be able to sell to foreign customers. Because there's free trade, that means you can sell, you can export, you can import. So yes. that means you can sell to foreign customers. And selling to foreign customers what? Would increase revenue and improve your balance of payments, current account. Clear? Is it clear? Yes. And the third point here, uh, the third question says, analyze using the production possibility curve. Diagram, the effect of an increase in unemployment on an economy. If there's unemployment in an economy, it means resources are not fully employed. And that is unemployment itself. Mm -hmm. That would reduce output. In the, that means the country is not performing to its, uh, uh, to, uh, the country is not performing to its highest capacity. Do you get the point? Mm -hmm. As a result, the, the, uh, the PPC curve will shift inward. Yes. That's the point there. I think it's clear. Yes. We go to D. They said, discuss whether or not an increase in the rate of income tax will reduce inflation. Income tax and a reduction in income tax, uh, they said, uh, an, uh, uh, an increase in income tax will definitely reduce disposable income. And if disposable income is reduced, purchasing power for consumers would reduce, reducing the aggregate uh, demand in the economy, which will lead to reduction in the demand pool inflation, a fall in demand pool inflation. That was the first point. The second point I made is that as purchasing power reduces, revenue for firms will fall. If revenue for firms falls, what happens? They will reduce their investment in capital goods. Reducing investment in capital goods will lead to that reduction in demand again to fall. I get demand will fall because firms will not be investing in capital goods. They won't be buying equipment. They won't be buying machines. So demand for machines will fall, leading to what? A fall in aggregate demand again. Demand pool inflation would fall. Yes or no? Yes. So I've, made, I've used two demand pool inflation there. The top point I made there is that because there's an increase in income tax, government revenue would increase. And if government revenue increases, government might be able to spend or subsidize for firms. Yes or no? If revenue increases for government, government might use that revenue, increase in revenue, to to uh, to encourage or to uh, to invest in supply side policies. Yes or no? Yes. So an increase in su supply side policy could be through subsidizing. So if government subsidizes for firms, that's the fourth point now. If government subsidizes for firms, the cost of production would fall for firms, and if cost of production fall for firms, cost push inflation would yes. reduce. Is it clear? Yes. That's about that. There's uh, four points. I made four points. I have government revenue through tax income. I love government spending on supply side policy measures. 
And one of the surprise life policy measures is through education and training, which reduces, uh, uh, which reduces waste. Yes. That will reduce price. Price will fall. Inflation is about price. Yes or no? Yes. So if I don't mention inflation, I have mentioned price because effect efficiency will bring about reduction in waste. Yes. And the fourth point is subsidizing. Is it clear now? Yes. All right. That's question two. We go to question three. Is that the population of Hungary is the most obese, obese in Europe. Hungarians eat fewer vegetables than most Europeans, and more food types that may be considered to be demerit goods in 20, demerit goods. In 2017, the Hungarian government introduced a tax on unhealthy food, known as the sheep's tax. The tax has, has had some success in moving demand to healthier foods. So my economists suggest that government should use price controls as well as taxes to influence the food market. Divine demerit goods. Demerit goods are goods that causes harm to the health or that causes external cost to third party. Yes. So we'll go to the second question. It said, explain the difference between an extension in demand and an increase in demand. An extension in demand is as a result of a change in the price of goods or services which is movement along the demand curve. That is extension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, extension in demand. Mm -hmm. The question says, uh, explain the difference between an extension in demand and an increase in demand. They are not the same. Extension in demand is as a result of a change in the price of a product, which means with the change in the price of the product, we're talking about movement along the demand curve. That is extension. It can expand or contract. That is movement along the demand curve. Okay. For increase in demand, an increase in demand is as a result of a change in non-pricing factors, like the level of income, availability of substitutes, the price of complementary goods, taste and preference. This will lead to uh, an increase in the demand, an increase in the demand an increase in the quantity demanded, mm -hmm. which means there's going to be a shift in the demand curve, right toward or to left. So extension in demand is true price, uh, a change in price, which is movement along the demand curve. Increase in price, increase in quantity demanded is as a result of a shift in demand, which is based on non-pricing factor. Is it clear? Yes. Okay. Question C, it said, analyze the effects on income distribution tax revenue and tax revenue of an increase in indirect tax. If there's, uh, what they're saying is that as soon as there's an increase in indirect tax, remember indirect tax is a tax on consumption. So as soon as there's increase, so the first thing is you have to understand that income can never be evenly distributed. There's no way income will be evenly distributed. We cannot have the same level of income. It's not possible. That's the first point that you have to put. The second point is that indirect taxes are taxes on consumption. Aggressive. And it is, thank you, it is regressive. So most of the time, if in, income tax, uh, if indirect taxes increases, it's, it's ter it is a burden on the shoulders of low income earners than high income earners. That's why it is regressive. That's the second point. Then tax revenue. Tax revenue will rise because income taxes, uh, indirect taxes is increasing. Income tax will rise. So as income tax rises, Price revenue will rise. But we have to think about if the demand for such products is price elastic or inelastic. So if, if, if government increases indirect taxes on food or on products that the demand is price in the, 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 uh, the price, uh, the demand is price inelastic, income tax uh, revenue would increase. But if they are on products that the price, uh, the demand is price elastic. People will stop buying them. They will stop. So revenue would not rise as a result of that. Mm -hmm. Is it clear? Yes. So we'll go to D. Discuss whether or not a government, discuss whether or not a government 
whether or not demand for cars, right? No. Yeah, yeah. Discuss whether or not the government should impose a maximum price on food. Yes, yeah. government should impose maximum price on food. First, because food is a basic necessity. Without food, it's our life, our living depends on food. So it's necessity. Do you understand? Yeah. And minimum, do you know what maximum price is? Maximum price means you can't charge above the you can't you can you can't charge above the equilibrium price. That means you, you have to charge below the equilibrium. That means you can't charge higher prices. There's a there's a limit you can charge. And the price you have to charge must be below the equilibrium price. Yes, do you that. understand? So the first reason is that food is a basic necessity. And that food is because food is a basic necessity, our living depends on it. So the price must be low. Two, it means some, because government is if government charges minimum maximum price, it means uh, prices uh, prices becomes low. The food the price of food becomes less. That means a lot of people would have the ability to buy food, which is good. Yes or no? Mm -hmm. Some people will be able to purchase food because the prices is less, and that will reduce poverty. Do you get the point now? Yes. The top point is that this may stop monopoly, monopoly food, monopoly for food supply. So if government is imposing maximum price on food, it means the the, the market for food will become more competitive. It's not going to be just for one person. Uh, do you get the point I'm making or not? No. If government doesn't charge, uh, if government doesn't give maximum price on, on food, the IS, uh, it means that those who have the ability to produce more, uh, who, those who are large businesses, might see the opportunity to charge whatever price they, they want to charge on food. They will take away small firms from the industry. Yes or no? Yes. That will bring about monopoly. But because there's maximum price that you can charge, that means there's, uh, you can't charge above the equilibrium price. This makes it not interesting to everybody. So it's, it's a, it becomes an open market for everyone. As a result, there will be competition. Do you get the point now? Yes. So it takes away monopoly. Because if government, can if government doesn't give maximum price, it means the highest spender will make more. So if you cannot afford to spend more, you are out of the business. So little by little, a lot of small businesses will be out of the business, creating monopoly. Yes. The top point, the last one I make is that certain price below the equilibrium level will reduce price. Clear? Yes. That's the point about that. So go to question four. Right? Yes. Okay. Point. Question four. Italy is the home of the world's oldest bank and some of the world's oldest car producers. Internationally, both industries are facing a number of challenges. The wages of bank workers and car workers are increasing. Demand for bank loans and for cars is changing in part due to changes in population size. It is predicted that, predicted that the price elasticity of demand, price elasticity of the PED for cars will also change in the future. So the first question says, states two functions of commercial banks. So one of the functions of commercial bank is that they accept deposits from customers. Another function of commercial bank is that they give loans to firms or customers. That is clear. We go to the second question, B. They said, explain two reasons why emigration from a country may increase. So emigration may increase in the country due to the following reasons. One, a rise in unemployment. If there's a rise in unemployment, it means people have to travel, go abroad to seek for, to search for jobs. That will increase emigration. Yes or no? Yes. The second point I make here is about lower living standards, which might be as a result of poor health care. So people might seek for better health care abroad. Yeah. The third point I make is about social unrest, social vices. Uh, war, especially war. If war continues to persist in a country, people would run away to, you know, for their own safety. That could reduce the number of people in the country. So these are the reasons why immigration can increase in a, in a, in a country. I think that is clear. Yes. Question C. Analyze the possible causes of a rise in the wages of bank workers. So a rise in wages of bank workers could be one. The demand for bank workers might increase. The demand for bank workers might exceed the supply of bank workers. So that would increase the wages of bank workers. That's the first point. The second point I make is that 
bank workers may, might use trade union. They might they might be part the bank workers might be part of the trade union. So they might be trade union members. And as a result, the trade union might have collected bargaining, which might help them to in increase their salary or wages. Clear. Okay. The top point I make is that bank may have banks might have earned large profits. The banks might have made more large profits. And if they make large profits, it is through the workers. So they might want to reward the bankers. And that might increase their wages. Yes. I think that is clear. Yes. And yeah, I made another point here. I said bank workers may have more experience and are more skilled. That might increase their salary. Clear? Yes. We go to D. Discuss whether or not demand for cars will become more price elastic in the future. First, what is price elasticity? I said price elasticity is the degree of responsiveness between the quantity demanded of a product as a result of a change in price. So if the price of a product increases and there's a significant change in the quantity demanded for such product, that means the demand for such product is price elastic. If the price of a product increases and there's no significant change in the quantity demanded of a product, then the price is uh, the demand for such product is price inelastic. So if it is less than one, it is price inelastic. If it is greater than one, it is price elastic. So if, a pro if price increases and people stop buying, that means the demand for such product is price elastic. If price changes and you still sell the same as you used to sell, the demand for such product is price inelastic. Is it clear? So they said, will the car, will the, the market for car become price elastic in the future? That means, will, it be, will consumers be conscious about price? That's the question. So yeah, I said yes. Demand for cars will become more price elastic in the future based on the following reason. One, the market for cars may be more, more, may be more competitive. If the market for cars become more competitive, that means a lot of firms will be producing cars. That makes customers to have more choices. Yes or no? So if you increase your own price, they, they could buy from other competitors. Yes or no? Yes. So that means demand for, price, uh, demand for cars is price elastic. The second point I make is that income level might fall in the future. Income level might fall in the future. Mm -hmm. If income level falls in the future, cars might take a large proportion of income. So people might stop buying cars as a result of their uh, as a result of a fall in their level of income. This, do, you get, do you get the second point here? Yes. The third point I make is about time, because they said in the future. So if price increases now, consumers might not have choices. But in the future, time will allow them to have choices because a lot of businesses would have come in in the future. So with time, consumers will be able to search for substitutes. And as soon as they find substitutes, they stop buying from you. So the demand becomes price elastic. Is it clear? Yes. And the last point I make here is availability of substitutes, like public transportation. So I don't need to have a car because I, there's public transportation, which is cheaper. Is it clear? Mm -hmm. Any question about that? So that's all about the paper.